Conan, and I've been involved in farming and horticulture for my whole life. I'm second or third generation farmer um, and second generation market gardener. Um, so I farm on a very small acreage farm with 15 acres of land and grow two acres of vegetables intensively. Um, and what I want to talk about is open to everybody. It's open to organic, non-organic, whatever type of farmer. And I think what I want to talk about is that it can be used in any system. It's kind of a mindset. It's about biological farming and it can be used in any system. Um, and I'm going to focus on horticulture because that's my specialty. But I'm kind of adamant that you can carry it through into grassland and into cereals and into other areas. But it's horticulture that I've worked on. So basically what happened was to tell the story, the, um, I was trained in conventional horticulture, worked in conventional horticulture on various farms and became quite disillusioned with the system and how it was working and how we were treating the land. And then I switched over to organics a lot of years ago. Switched over to organics a lot of years ago. And basically I had trained in conventional horticulture and I had a, a reasonably good understanding of the use of fungicides and insecticides and herbicides. And I moved over to organic and because I had trained in conventional horticulture, when I looked at what was going on in organic, I thought, uh, this isn't working organically. I thought this isn't working. So basically what happened, and I'm talking about the early 80s, what happened was there was a group of us got into organic horticulture in the early 80s in Ireland. And we had a huge issue with weeds, for instance. So what we did was we covered most of our holdings with plastic and we grew through plastic. Now, okay, it was on a small scale, but the same thing is happening today on a larger area in organic farming. A lot of the, the fields are being covered in biostarch. So it's the same kind of issues. You can multiply this up. It doesn't mean, ah, oh, it's a small acreage, it doesn't matter. You can multiply up all the causes and effects. So we, we came along, we covered it in plastic. And I, so there was kind of a whole key of issues that developed over the years. And basically, and a bit my slides will show that, but basically, you know, we covered in plastic, we were going through plastic, and I thought, this is the most goddamn awful job. I'm not a carpet layer. I'm a gardener, I'm a farmer. And pulling in and pulling out sheets of plastic out of polytunnels, it's like covering a, a silage clamp on a windy day. So I just thought, this is not for me, this doesn't work. Um, then also, I was quite disappointed with the flavour of the food I was producing. I was quite disappointed with the flavour of the food that I was producing. I almost felt that it had a kind of a plastic-like residue taste to it. And I thought, oh God, that's not what I want to be. Then I progressed along and what happened was I noticed that with various methods of farming that I was using, my perennial weed population was increasing. And you know, kind of the thing was then, ah, oh, it's gone out of control, put it back into red clover for a couple of years and give it a rest, give it a feed, whatever, and come back into production. But of course, the seeds of the perennial weed were in the ground. So when we came back into production again, the perennial weed came back. And so there was kind of a, a whole range of developments that happened or kind of light bulb moments. And I began to kind of really look at this. And then I began to, I began to read I began to read all about different guys like Gary Zimmer and people like this and about what they were doing and their approach to biological farming. And I thought, okay, that's good. That makes sense. I'm going to try it out. I'm going to, I'm going to wean myself off the plastic. I'm going to get it. I'm going to get my hand. I'm going to get a handle on this weed control thing. 
because I'm not going to lie on my belly or expect somebody else to do it on a machine behind a tractor hand weeding. So I'm going to get it. the other thing I thought is I'm not going to cultivate the hell out of my soil in order to control the weed. Now I could give you 20 trains of thought that went on around this that brought me to biological farming. So that was all that. And then the other thing was that I have to say, there's always kind of a fun element in my farming and a fun element in my way of thinking. And as somebody, as Mick McHugh said, I farm on a very wet piece of acidic land in East Clare. And, you know, I drive down to the Blackwater Valley, I drive over to Carlo, I drive all these places, and I'd see all these guys powering on with tractors. And I thought, I want to be one of them. <laughs> I want to do that type of farming, but still I want to live in East Clare. And in a way, that kind of introduced me to green manures. It's a very kind of a silly way for it to happen, but it introduced me to green manures because most of our work is sowing stuff precisionally in plug trays or directly into the ground or whatever. And suddenly I could get 25 kilos of buckwheat. I could go out, I could broadcast it, I could get my horses and I could go for it with an eight foot harrow. Okay, it was only half an acre, but at least I could have a go at that type of farming. So that's kind of what got me into green manures. So it's not all sort of like heavy duty stuff, you know? Um, so basically, so I began this whole journey and I found a whole range of, and I'm still learning the whole process. But basically what I found out, the first thing that I found out is that uh, our climate here in Ireland, our soil type is very different to anywhere else in the world. We have our own climate. And what works well in the States, what works well in England, what works well in Germany, might necessarily work in Ireland. That was one thing I found out. The second thing I found out was that, the, for instance, is that with green manures, that the seeding, the seeding rate that's recommended in England is suitable for field scale cover crops, green manures, but it doesn't actually work for intensive horticulture because in intensive horticulture, we have a lot of available nutrients available very quickly post crop or we have them hanging around and we need to mop them up with a cover crop because if we don't mop them up with cover crop, a weed will pass out the cover crop. The, 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 cover, the, the cover crop that will succeed, given the nutrient that's most dominant or available, a cover, a weed will pass it out. And that's totally a waste of space if you have your ground becoming more weedy. So in a horticultural situation, and now this is recognized around the world, that our seeding rate needs to be double the recommended rate for field rate. Is that clear? Okay, so then, so then I went on and, um, and I found out that it's a very particular group of species of, of green manures that grow very well in Ireland. And like we'd love to be, we'd all love to be grown alfalfa. Okay, alfalfa will grow here in certain soils and in certain years, but alfalfa won't grow everywhere in Ireland because of our pH, because of our soil type. So it's a very unique group. The next thing about it was that they, they always talk about this winter kill. And we, you know, in the States, in Europe, um, you get this fantastic winter kill where the cover crop is killed over the winter and basically in the springtime you get a clean seed bed. We don't get that type of winter kill in Ireland, most cases. What we, get, what we get is we get a damp year, a damp, a lot of growth in the winter. Our growth doesn't shut down for a long time. The green manure keeps growing. And basically what happens is that the green manure then dies out in big patches in the field. And that large patch in the field in turn soaks quite a lot of water, a lot of rain that can fall in January, February of the year. And as a consequence of that, we get perennial weeds. So we're very, the reason I'm just picking up on those couple of pints 
I could actually talk for three days about cover crops, but it's a very unique, it's a very unique climate we have. It's a very unique range of cover crops that grow. And even in relation to the establishment of the green manures or the cover crops, it's unique how we have to incorporate them, how we have to till the soil, all those type of issues. You know, you'll see, you'll see videos or whatever of the states where they kind of plow on. Very often we can't plow on, we just have to slow down <laughs> and make sure we get that seed well covered. It's a very, very different circumstances. Okay, so I just have a... And like, the thing about it is, so my question is like, my question is, does biological farming work? Does biological farm, farming work? Okay. Um, so I've been working on this now for a good few years and um, I would say it does. <laughs> I would say it does. And basically here's the cover crop. Um, and the cover crop here is a very, a very diverse species. Um, and it's true for what all the specialists say and what all the research say is that the higher the diversity, the healthier the soil underneath. I found that firsthand and I've seen the result firsthand because how I can see the result firsthand is that I have a cover crop and then I grow a bed of rocket, for example. I know that that 30 square meter bed of rocket can yield 232 kilos in a season. And if it only, if it only yields 100 kilos, well then something is wrong. My, my information is very quickly available from what I do. It's very, very quick turnaround. So, so here's a curve of crop. And it's true that a diverse species builds good soil. Okay, that's one thing. The other thing that's interesting about cover crops is that you can actually separate out the cover crops and you can use various crops to remedy the ills on your soil. You can use various crops to remedy the ills. You can also use various cover crops to mop up nutrients. So they're like an incredible, interesting crop to grow. So in that, in that regard, and we have used them very successfully on a program in Cork where the ground was infested with perennial weeds and we did a cover cropping sequence, primarily buckwheat and cereal rye for a season and we eliminated the perennial weeds. And this was observed by non-organic farmers as well. So, so they, have a very, they have a very clear role to play in the control of weeds and in the balancing of nutrients. That's my experience. And when I go, when I go to a farm and I see somebody saying, I have a big problem with scotch and I'm going to, I'm going to just get in with a harrow. I'm going to plough it up. I'm going to get in with a springtime harrow and I'm physically going to rake it all to the headland and burn it. I'm thinking, you're burning your fertility. You're burning your minor nutrients. Why don't you harvest the potential of the scotch in situ and leave the minerals, leave the nutrients, leave whatever biology it has there in situ and harvest it and change the metabolism of the soil in order that it doesn't grow perennial weed. That is the basic, one of the basic keys of biological farming in my opinion. You change the biological status of the soil and the weed will fade away. Okay, so that's, that's my diverse mix. Okay, the interesting thing is the slides that I'm showing, most of them are from a bit of land that I rented um, over the road just two years ago. 
So basically what happened was a bit, it was a bit of land, it was a three acre field and it was idle for 17 years. It had, um, it had briars, nettles, docks, you name it, this height. No animal had stood in it and it had no input for 17 years. It's very, it's very valuable land for development. And basically the people gave it to me and I spent one year cleaning it up and harvesting the fertility that was in the docks, the nettles, the whatever, and trying to maintain the biology that was in the soil. That's what I spent one year doing. And I thought, okay, when they gave me the three acres, I thought, bingo, this is going to test all my theories. Okay, so that's the cover crop. And that was, and I grew many different types of cover crops at many different um, rates to see the impact it had on the soil and on the weeds. So that's the cover crop, a really dirty piece of ground. There's no docks, there's no docks, there's no, there's no nettles, there's no other weeds coming. The cover crop has outcompeted it. Now I went on and followed with another cover crop, but my argument is I changed the biology of the soil. I changed the biology of the soil. So that was, that's one of the things. Then this is just so simple. This is just so simple of a concept. And the concept is that the, the manure, the manure, the manure, the compost, the fertility source you put onto your ground should be biologically enhanced. And if it's biologically enhanced, it will not grow weeds. It will, if it's biologically balanced, biologically enhanced, it will grow crop and it will not grow weeds. That's a theory. And this is me trying to figure it out. Does it work? And this was a very simple slide. This is a crop of spinach. It was planted and the, the, the basically the soil was fertilized with an uncomposted raw manure. So it was a manure, 50% straw, 50% animal, a lot of nitrogen in it, a lot of nitrogen freely available. And the concept of biological farming is the soil has to work too hard to swallow that manure. Okay, so a very, very simple con concept. And like, when you think in organics, what did we do? What did we do forever? What we did forever was we got 25 ton of farmyard manure uncomposted out of the shed. We, f we, tr we threw it onto plowed ground or whatever type of ground. We threw it onto plowed ground and we plowed it down and made it anaerobic. Biological farming is all about O2, <laughs> O2. So here's uncomposted, same crop, planted the same day, same bed. Look at the difference. Isn't that mad? <laughs> Isn't that mad? So simple, so simple. Okay, there was a bit of energy expanded in, in preparing the compost, we'll call it. How many? Three more. Okay, I better hurry on. So isn't that, isn't that mad? Um, and and like I mean, I could I could go on in a whole in a whole series of things about which spinach tasted better and all that. Okay. Here's here's my next slide, and um, that's just the green manure again, showing the diverse species. Okay, I once I spoke about that. This is interesting, okay? So I, I'm, I want to try out this biological farming. Okay, so this is a polytunnel. Um, this is at home, it was taken last week. And the polytunnel, the polytunnel was only covered there about a month ago, okay? Um, so basically the, my theory here is, and this comes from a lot of people, so what they, what they put forward to us, all the experts, is that most of the nutrition is in the soil. 95% of the nutrition is in the soil. It's been 
spoken about here over the last day and a half. 95% is in the soil, and if you get the biology active, the crop will grow, the weeds won't grow. Okay, so I had to try that out. So what did I do? What did we do? We were a team. What we did was we got a, fi we got a field. We were going to put up a new polytunnel. It was um, virgin land, we call it, or it was grassland. And we got a couple of bales of old silage. So we got an acidic product and old silage that was punctured, that was damaged. And we rolled out the bales of silage onto the grassland, okay? Uh, onto that old silage, we added a couple of wheelbarrows of compost activator. Well, it's compost from our own compost heaps that was an activator onto the silage. And we put on a little bit of seaweed meal, very unscientific. And into that, into that area then, we grew a fine crop of pumpkins, okay? We came out of the pumpkins, we took off the pumpkins, and I lightly tilled the land. I aerated the land. The one thing I thought after the pumpkins, and just virtu by virtue of the growing season, the missing ingredient was oxygen. I lightly activated the land, and my two interns made it up into a series of 30-inch beds, nine beds in the polytunnel, and this is the crop taken last week. These are the plants. The plants are in, only in the ground 15, 16 days. The interesting thing, I'm interested in what's above the ground, but I'm more interested in what's in the root ball. So what does that tell us? That tells us that we're expanding a lot of energy, spreading a lot of fertilizer, and a lot of what we need is actually in the soil already but we have to be able to harvest it, okay? Um, so is it biologically balanced, that tunnel? I'd ha without testing it, I would hazard a guess. The crop is uniform, it tastes good, and there's no weeds. There's no weeds out competing. There's no chickweed. So there isn't piles of nitrogen floating around, you know? This is the field, the same field that we took over, okay? And I'll put my hat on it. This is the standard of, this might sound a bit big-headed, this is the standard of organic horticulture, vegetable production that we have to achieve in Ireland. This is the standard. This, and it can be done with biological farming. And does, and most, most of the research around this type of farming has been done in the States by these guys. Some in Europe, but a hell of a lot of it has been done in the States. And the basic, like there's a family called the Nordells who have done a pile of work around this for 25 years. And our basic principle is weed, weed the soil, not the crop build the biology, that weeding the crop is a waste of space. This field of one and a half acres got incidental hand weeding. We walked through it a few times during the year, chatting and spending maybe 20 or 30 minutes pulling out an odd dock. Why, why, is, it, why is it clean? It's clean because it's biologically balanced. That's why it's clean. It's, sorry, Gary, I'll just root on. Okay, um, my final slide. Okay, that's my son. He's six foot five, okay? <laughs> and he's standing amongst a crop of, of sunflowers, the only, the only amendment that that sunflower got to grow was the sod. The sod. No fertilizer, no nothing. So the purpose of this experiment was, is there very often enough fertility in the soil to grow a crop? Or is there, are we, are we not tapping into the full potential 
of our soil. How about that? Thank you very much. Very good. I think you got your... Get your